what can be said about the definition of the word enigma? Only that it is something difficult to describe, difficult to explain, and that it has a complicated significance, especially as we move to certain topics. In this episode, I am joined by a fellow American, born, raised, and living in the United States. We explore her American experience. As a child with origins in Central Asia, her story brings into light a post-9-11 New York, her views and struggles as a member of the LGBTQ community, being a special needs teacher, a polyglot, and her international travels, while also giving us her answer to the questioning of how American can you be before being born in the United States is not enough, and what constitutes and defines a person as an American. This is Haj. Welcome back to the ESL sessions on this, another episode of Enigma. And in today's episode, we're actually going to be hearing a story of another American because how we see things and how things are, this person is an American in, in every sense of the word and every and within the scope of what we're going to be talking about today. But before I give any more details and, and get into asking questions, I'll let her introduce herself, give us a little bit about her background, and then we'll go ahead and we'll continue with the interview. So whenever you're ready. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Hodge. I'm from New York. I'm a year old Afghan American. Uh, I was born here. My parents came from Afghanistan back in the 80s. Um, I am a, a special education teacher, so that's one of a, a challenges that I love. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, what else can I say? Well, I guess maybe once you'll get you'll get to know me more as the episode progresses, but that's that's who I am. Gotcha. So with with this information being that like you mentioned right now, you're Afghan American, your parents came from Afghanistan, and especially with the most recent situation with with the United States pulling out of Afghanistan. Um I'll touch a little bit on that in a little bit. But it it struck me before we even uh started the interview, even pre recording on the questions that I asked you, a lot of the things that kind of grasped me was the fact that you were also an ESL student, not for long, yeah. obviously, mm -hmm. but you, you also are buried in a lot of other languages outside of the, the traditional, obviously Farsi, English and uh, Pashto. But mm -hmm. why don't you tell me a little bit more about your, your experience with language, especially being that New York is, is as we know it. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people from watching TV is just a, what do you call it, a melting pot of different cultures and languages? All right. Um, yeah, I was an ESL when I was in kindergarten. Um, I graduated ESL after the first year. Um, I took Spanish when I was in junior high, so uh, seventh grade. This was back before the whole changes in grades. So I started uh, Spanish in seventh grade all the way to high school. So seven through 12, I was really good at it. I mean, I could speak it like, like it was a, a, a native language to me, but unfortunately, because I did so well on the regents, I didn't need to take a language class in college and I stopped speaking it. So now it's kind of rusty. I can understand a few words here and there, but it's not the way it used to be when I was in high school. I, I regret it. I wish I just continued to speak it. Um, what else? Pashto, English. Uh, Farsi, a little bit of Hindi also, because Afghans have a tendency of watching Bollywood movies and you have the subtitles. So I would watch that for years and I picked up on it real fast. But again, after a while, I stopped watching the movies and I just lost the language. So I'm multilingual and then I, in some languages, it, I understand it. Gotcha. So... Let me ask you myself, because I, like I said, I speak English, um, I speak Spanish fluently, and I speak a little bit of German, and I love, I love languages and stuff. Did you ever notice any of, like, a lot of the similarities with, with a lot, with the, the what do you call it, with the Arabic languages, Pashto, um, Farsi, and even, and even Hindi? Yeah, um, Hindi is, is similar to Urdu, which is a language in Pakistan, and it's basically a mixture of of Pashto and, and, and Farsi together, which is Ur Urdu. 
um, ironically, a lot of Afghan, I'm sorry, a lot of Arabic words are, are derived from Spanish, like camisa, which is shirts. Mm -hmm. We say, Afghans say kamis, which is, so a lot of uh, those words are, are very similar. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Gotcha. Yeah. And I did notice that, especially, especially growing up and then obviously now, now as an adult, having friends from, from all over the place, both from Egypt and Iraq and, and even friends from um, Sri Lanka and India, like we would, we would talk and we would look at certain like similarities with it. Like outside of the fact that we were communicating in English, mm -hmm. they would speak their native language with, with somebody else. And, and then I would listen in and like, Hey, did you say this? Did you mean that? And it's like, that's one thing that always surprised me. And it's like, that's one of the beauties of, of the language is that it always pulls from, from different, from different, uh, regions and, and areas. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but, mm -hmm. yeah go cool. ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to. I'm just saying I agree with you. Like, yeah, it's, it's really cool how it's like so the areas are so far apart. The countries are so far apart, yet they have like these little few words that mean the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. But before we get into like the current and uh, a modern time frame, um, let's actually let's bring it back a little bit. So you were born in New York. Uh, you can mm -hmm. give us a little bit of information about how, how it was growing up in New York. When were you, uh, yeah, around what year were you born or what decade, if you could feel comfortable. And then tell us a little bit about your, your experience, a little bit of your, about your experience in school and, and how it was uh, growing up in New York, like I said, being such a cultural city. So I was born in the mid-80s. Believe it or not, I'm, I'm old, <laughs> but I don't look it. Um, Growing up, I lived in an area where it was predominantly Hispanic and Chinese. So, funny enough, I never really had any problem. To this day, I still don't. So, um, I have, I call them the, like, United Nations. I have friends from all over the country. From I'm sorry, from all over the world, which I still do. So, um, a lot of my friends when I was growing up were... Hispanic, uh, Asian, a, a few were, were African American, um, a few were white, but because of the, the, the area that I grew up, it was pr predominantly Asian and Hispanic. Uh, school was pretty good, I'm not going to lie, even though I was, the, I, there weren't a lot of Muslims in, that, in, the, in the school, they, they still treated me equally like like everyone else, which was great. And um, I think, yeah, that junior high, same thing. Junior high, there were more Muslims. And then in high school, uh, there was a lot more, a lot of Muslims to the point where we even had like a Muslim club. I didn't join because I I grew up with, uh, with everyone but Muslim for friends. So I never really associated with them. But um, it was interesting how as I got older, more Muslims came into my life, but yet I still didn't want to connect with them. Oh, okay. And then around what time did this, did, did, well, when you were in middle school, transitioning from elementary school to middle school, around what time frame was this? Towards the end of the 90s. Towards the end of the 90s? Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I find that a literally interesting. Like, I've have, I also have friends from, uh, from New York, and mm -hmm. she's Puerto Rican. I'm French, she's Puerto Rican. And, and that's one of the other things that I was like, that I've always noticed within, within the community of also myself and in the way that I've grew up with my friends is there's, there's a unity between minorities or, or people of ethnic descent. We just tend to gravitate to each other regardless mm -hmm. of, of who's available or what culture we're back. Mm -hmm. Because like I said, it's, it's one of those things that, that it's, it's always astounding to see a lot of the similarities, even depending on where you grew up with. Uh, with who you grew up with and where you grew up at is what I meant to say. Um, but yeah, but she would tell me the exact same things. Like she would have obviously friends from, from Puerto Rico being uh, predominantly Hispanic, but also other friends from other areas. And, and it's like I said, it's really interesting that you bring it up like that, especially growing up in, in the mid early nineties to mid nineties during that time frame. Now, mm -hmm. What other experiences do you have now that you, when, now that you look back at it, now that you're a teacher from, from how children interact to, to how you, you see you interacted with your, your fellow students or, 
or just other kids from different cultures uh, growing up? It's a lot more inclusive now than it was back then that I've noticed. Um, as a teacher, I work in an area where it's predominantly Italians and Greeks. So, but there's as well here and there, um, but they're always included, which I like. Not that it wasn't inclusive back then either, it was, but I think now with this new generation and how times have changed, everyone is involved now, which is great. I like it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, no. And that's, that's really, that really brings me to, to my next question. So growing up in the early, in like I said, the, in the mid nineties, uh, what do you call it? Early nineties, mid nineties, obviously being from Afghanistan, Afghanistan descent. And then how you told me into, and the, what do you call in the questions I asked, how was that transition over once nine 11 happened being that, that I think a lot of people don't understand it from the ethnic perspective that it affected a lot of people very differently and it was a very okay. specific point in time where um i'll just i'll just be direct with you uh being in the military a I, I i interact with a lot of people and being honest outside of my own opinion a lot of the the white the caucasian people remember 9 11 very differently versus to how i remember it even though i was okay. i was about maybe six six, seven years old when it, when it happened. But mm -hmm. like I said, being your, you're being specific to where, where your family is originally from and how you grew up, how did that affect you? It's funny. Uh, you say that because, um, back in the nineties, no one knew where Afghanistan was. Like you would say I'm from Afghanistan. They'd be like, wait, where that's a country. And then of course, nine 11 happened and it was on the map. Everyone suddenly knew where the country was. Um, when 9-11 happened, I was in high school, so I know I was old enough to understand what was happening. Um, that was a rough time because my high school had a lot of Muslims and we were always targeted. They would say things like, how's your uncle Benny? Mm -hmm. You know, Bin Laden. Yeah. And because he was in Afghanistan, they always thought that he was also an Afghan. I'm like, he's not an Afghan. Knock it off they would just like bully me say nasty and other people also some luckily nothing physically happened to me but there were incidents where a lot of the muslims in my school would get beaten up they would get bullied they would get shoved uh into walls and all that stuff but i think because i kept like a low profile i didn't want to bother and 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 instigate anything or I, if they said something, I just let it go from one ear out the other and just kept on walking. But it did definitely affect me because I'd sit there at the table, i do my writing, and then I remember someone would always like kick the back of my chair. I could have just turned around and said, knock it off. But I just was like, I was very passive and I was like, you know what? Keep kicking it. It's not going to bother me. I know you want a reaction from me because you want me to, to be viewed as that angry Muslim who hates people keep kicking all you want she kept doing it for 45 minutes and i'm like go ahead i'm not gonna let it bother me but the little petty minor things like that they really did target me gotcha so it was definitely a very critical time especially mm -hmm. especially over the fact that at that point you're already becoming an adult any right. anything right. that you've you've already experienced to that point has has been like from what you're telling me is isn't as as we call it, as critical just because of the okay. the inclusiveness the amount of times that the amount of of cultures and and people you've interacted up until that point but it it brings something really specific to to the way that the certain events tend to shift the focus on on people like currently in in the way that right now with Gaza and Israel is there's there's an instigator and then there's there's the, the there's the instigator and then there's the the oppressed but also the the other fact that people tend to forget about this whole entire situation is the people that have nothing to do with it but are the easy targets the prime targets what i can tell you from my experience is even post 9 11 i i had i didn't have a similar experience like that just because being from mexico being being from such nearby 
it's a different it was a different type of interaction in that way but i can relate to that because we would also receive certain things at a certain point in my life i actually was an illegal immigrant so being targeted in the exact same way hey go back to your country you're you're illegal you don't belong here i was like and same thing dirty names being called anything you can think of and to to the extent I, I can honestly I commend you the fact that you you mentioned that you didn't retaliate back me I can say that I was not very um well it had very well tacked emotions during that time frame especially since it was closer to around 2000 um 2009 2010 but mm, okay yeah but it's 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 like I said it's really it's really interesting that people don't see that that that's what ends up happening that it's not the people that are that are there the ones that are actually doing what they're doing it's the the outside people the what do you call the people on the outside that have nothing to do with it or just because of circumstances and relations tend to be connected to to a certain region of the world or certain culture and Mm -hmm. and with that so with finishing high school and going into into adulthood um Mm -hmm. how was that for you working and and experiencing things outside especially being in the post 9-11 world um honestly because of work and school i really had no like outside life believe it or not but work-wise it seemed okay i really didn't notice any any hostility towards me being a muslim and same with school i went to a school which was very small um Believe it or not, the school that I went to had a lot of minorities. So I felt more comfortable being in that school, college, <laughs> um, because everyone was a minority. So we, no one felt like I hate you or I can't stand you or, or anything like that. There was none of that. Maybe because we were all, my, maybe because we were all minorities, we all felt, um, I don't know what's that word to use, like, we felt like we all understood each other. Gotcha. So mm-hmm. with that, how were your, your other interactions then with, with all the other cultures, especially say once, once, because like I said, being, being a minority, being ethnic, you always want mm-hmm. to know where people are from and, and people asking about it. How mm-hmm. were there some weird reactions or just something that was off putting to certain people when you mentioned that, yes, even though you were born in the in the United States, you were American, U.S. citizen, but you had roots in, in Afghanistan and your parents being Afghanistan from Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Did that cause problems or were there interactions that were just, like I said, just off putting to certain people? I wouldn't say off putting, but more like confusion because mm-hmm. they were like, OK, you're a Muslim. Um, but you were born here, so do you consider yourself more American or more Afghan? So to me, it was always, uh, I'm in the middle. So, and they would say, like, well, what do you mean in the middle? Like, what do you tend to lean more towards? At that time, I was completely confused. I had no idea. But now I lean more towards the American side because as I keep growing up, I'm furthering my way from my culture, which I really shouldn't. But you know, I'm, I'm a rebel, but back then it was more of, so are you, are you, do you, are you more traditional or are you more American? Like, do you, they would ask me things like, okay, so you, you're, you're in America. Do you drink? Yes. But you're not supposed to. Well, I do. I was born in America. It's around me. To me, it's a norm to see alcohol in a restaurant. Uh, there were things like, do you have tattoos? At that time, I didn't have any. I was like, I don't want a tattoo. Um, Pretty much just things like that. Like, which one do you lean more towards? Why do you do this when you're not supposed to? And to me, it was like, but it's a normal thing. I I see it as a norm. Yeah. And I think that's always a little bit confusing, especially the to other people that either are coming from outside of the United States and have spent a lot of time in the United States like myself and still cling to a mm-hmm. lot of the cultural norms of, of what do you call it, of our of our country of origin, but also within like the religious aspect where where certain mm-hmm. things they just melt so so seamlessly with our day our day to day life that when you hear of somebody else who who has a different culture, religion and stuff, but also you recognize and you know that 
they too follow those same uh those same standards those same standards with mm-hmm. with the melding of culture and religion when you meet somebody outside of the normal it it does seem a little jarring because i i've had that experience by myself but at the same time mm-hmm. i can understand how you're saying it where it's like you grow up in a certain place for so long and it's a little bit difficult to not get yourself not not to be able to blend in with with your surroundings and mm-hmm. and especially in a more broad sense there that you're now in a in a higher in a, yeah, in a higher developmental time frame in your life it's no longer just centered on hey you're your children you're still learning you're still developing that aspect of whether what's what people consider right or wrong which in reality mm-hmm. we understand that there is no right or wrong in that sense that Correct. there's there's a lot of things to still to be discovered and that's that's really interesting because it takes me to my next question so you you studied you went to college, you you had these interactions with other ethnic groups, with other people from, from different parts of the world. At what point did you decide or or did you see yourself changing from the the normal, the standard way of living as uh as a well, I don't want to say a devout Muslim, but mm-hmm. as a practicing Muslim. And and especially somebody from from the culture in in the Middle East, if that's the correct. And to me, if I may ask you, what what is the correct way to? Well, what what is what is an acceptable way for you to to refer to that region? Because I've heard it many ways, and calling it the Middle East honestly seems really. It's it's a bad way to put it in reality because it's it's a large region. Yeah, where Afghans don't consider themselves Middle Eastern the correct regional term would be central asia Mm -hmm. we're central asian yeah gotcha okay so then uh, speaking of it in that geographical sense like that Mm -hmm. Uh being being from central asia and Mm -hmm. and at what point from your culture and, and like i said from your your practicing as a muslim when did you see yourself kind of skewing away from that is what i meant to say uh ask earlier and probably college mm-hmm I would say probably college because I, I, like I said, I grew up with certain things that in America, it's normal, you know, like, um, like I said, alcohol in the restaurants, it's normal. You go to Afghanistan, that stuff is not going to be around because it's considered a sin to be drinking. So to me, when someone says, do you drink? I'm like, well, yeah, I'll have a drink. Why not? It's right there. Um, but around college time in my twenties, I was just like, I was like, you know what? I grew up in a developing country. I'm sorry, a developed country, not a developing, a developed (laughs) country. Um, (laughs) um, this is just my way of life. This is how I grew up. So to me, I'm still going to be, a a a a Muslim, I won't practice as much because that's just not a daily thing for me. So college time was probably when I decided to shift my, my attention towards the, the, uh, the, the American side. Gotcha. Okay. Did your parents at, well, depending on how, how comfortable you are, did your parents actually try to steer you back into into being more devout into the in into being a muslim into your culture and then how did that play out if you can explain yeah sometimes they would say things like oh you need to be a bit more you need to have a bit more faith in you you need to have a bit more religion in you anytime there was like something happening in a family like just dumb drama they would be like oh it's because we're not as religious as as we are we meaning me they wouldn't they wouldn't say them so i would be like no that's not really it it's just that's how things play out i don't think me having the lack of praying five times a day is going to change anything so they've they've tried to shift me back but i'd always be like to me it makes no difference for me why should me praying and being a good muslim mean anything yeah and it makes a lot of sense too when when you look at it like how you said it earlier growing up in the united states the united states even though for being 
as as highly centralized in in religion as it likes to talk mm-hmm. and and put itself as is is a far from it especially when we look at it like in a very religious scriptural way i grew up mm-hmm. catholic very close to christianity and mm-hmm. and i can even say in in the time frame that i was in uh, in boot camp i was actually able to to attend the islamic classes for for muslim and and learn a little Whoa. bit more about how um the establishment of muhammad uh, the the necessity for the quran and stuff like that but it wasn't but it wasn't actually being forced to us right in mm-hmm. the same way by um was it the, the i don't want to say rabbi i think that's jewish by the uh, pastor or or the 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 religious person that was that was uh-huh. teaching it there and and it's it makes a lot of it's a lot of contradictions to that like i said especially like i said being being in the military, being in boot camp, having the options to mm-hmm. both be attending Catholic services or Christian services, but gravitating towards uh, Muslim to just get to to expand and, and learn a little bit more because a lot of a lot of how you're saying is a lot of what you're saying with the way that you grew up and things were for you. I feel a little bit in in the same way, and especially when it comes to religion being mm-hmm. being one of those central points with culture with uh-huh. with how culture really circles around it and and there's a lot of guilt to it if you're not practicing or if you're not thoroughly devout as as your neighbor mm-hmm. or as your friends or as your parents and your friends and your parents friends it's it's always mm-hmm. looked at mm-hmm. like that so skewing a little bit away from that your how was your interaction though with your parents outside of religion uh now being an adult, especially going through what what happened in between the the early two thousands, nine eleven, and then post nine eleven, how was that for you guys? Um, well, they're very conservative, and I'm not obviously. Mm-hmm. So there, we would always be clashing on everything, whether it be um things like religion, uh, the LGBTQ community um uh things like abortion just think anything like that we would always clash i am i'm very liberal and they're not so you can just imagine what kind of a household that Mm -hmm. can be so it's 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 still been rough even to this day gotcha and Mm -hmm. and like you said mentioning earlier mentioning just right now actually uh the lgbtq community you yourself, mm-hmm. you you mentioned in the question, but I'll let you, I'll let you expand on that. Okay. Uh, how involved are you in the community? How what what is your yeah? What are your views on it, and how involved are you in the community in the LGBTQ community? Oh, I'm a huge supporter. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge supporter. Um, I myself am questioning my uh my own sexuality because several years ago, a little over a decade ago, um, I was. I don't want to say involved, but I was definitely thinking and wondering if I am leaning towards females. And my family kind of found out and they were so against it. They were like, this is not going to happen. So, and then the person who I liked, she kind of also, she kind of was like, I never want to talk to you again. Because like a friend of hers or a mutual friend of ours, so um, she was basically, I don't want to say brainwashed, but she was convinced that what she was doing with me was wrong also. So because of that, um, I kind of had to hide my, my, my true self for a long time, for like 14 years, mm-hmm. about 14 years now. Yeah. Um, to this day, my family still doesn't know that I'm, I'm, I'm questioning myself. Um, it wasn't until November of last year where I started having those feelings again. And they don't know this. They don't know that um, I was starting to have feelings for someone. Um to the point where it just affected my mental health. And 
I've become very involved by by just supporting them, especially during Pride. I remember in June, I have my Apple Watch, and one of the things was the the Pride stripes. So my mom saw it, and she goes, "What is this? Get rid of it." I and the thing is with that that specific face on on my Apple Watch, if you tap on it. It kind of does like a guitar thing, so the the strings will will like wiggle and everything. I just made a, a a little white line and I said, "Oh, they're just guitar strings of rainbow colors." And my students who have autism, you know, that's something that that will like excite them. Like they tap on it and they just get excited. So I just I just put this on and they tap on it and it gets them excited and happy. Like no big deal. But even something like rainbow. Anywhere around me, she, my parents, well, my mom especially, would be like, "What is this? What you like? You like this community now?" To me, it's like, "Why do you care? They're not even harming you. Who cares?" So you can only imagine if I ever told them that I I'm questioning myself or that I am gay, lesbian, bi, whatever. They'll disown me. So unfortunately, I have to stay quiet about this. Yeah. And there's a lot of duality in that. Like I said, I've noticed it with with the way things tend to happen, especially being in. In a more accepting place, way mm-hmm. more accepting what it is, but even then, like I said, from from my friends that I know are are gay or even my uncles that have been out for for close to 15 years at this point now, there there was still a little bit of animosity towards mm-hmm. their their way of life to where like i said if i can tell you this one of my uncles him and his we'll say quote unquote best friend but they did get married in i think it was around 2010 2011 even for the longest time my my family would never well yeah my family wouldn't accept it the fact that he was gay or or was even leaning towards that that sexual mm-hmm. orientation it was always like nope it's your uncle and his roommate it's your it's your uncle and his roommate. They're just buddies. They're just mm-hmm. buddies, and mm-hmm. and subconsciously, I can understand that that how you how you say it, where it's a little bit difficult trying to accept that, trying to trying to accept that from the outside perspective. But me not knowing much of this, especially growing up with with a a very enshrouded view of of the LGBT community, I can still see a lot of the signs that like people say in hindsight, it's like, oh man, like maybe he was gay. Maybe he was, maybe these things weren't just the norm or they weren't, they weren't Mm -hmm. just seen as normal. And it Mm -hmm. did take, luckily for us, it did take a little bit for, for my family to, to finally accept my uncle, but they're still there. Even still to an extent, there's still a lot of the, what we call machismo, a lot of the whole subsequent masculine masculinity for like from my uncles and even sometimes from my dad, but he's become a lot more accepting of it. But, I said, not everybody hearing your story, not everybody has that opportunity and, and can actually relate to that. So Mm -hmm. with, with that in itself, do you ever, even if it means, this is more of a personal question, even if it Mm -hmm. means separating yourself from your family and, and um, essentially personally disowning yourself from what ties you to your family, would you ever let them know? I think, well, here's the thing. Right now, I live with my family. Mm. So that's why I can't say anything. But I think if I were to ever move out and I'm in my safe space, and if I ever maybe get involved with someone, maybe I will. But at the moment right now, I can't say anything. Gotcha. And it sucks. And it sucks because sometimes you just need, like, family to support you and you, like, you just need their advice or just tell them like, listen, I'm going through something. I just want you to be there for me if I need you. I can't do that. I can't. I have to rely on friends, coworkers, anyone else but them. And it's sad. Yeah, it really is. It it really is, and it's something that that I can definitely understand why the community really rallies around when when somebody goes through a lot of that, a lot of that trauma, and a lot of that. That situation is because you can't find it. You can't always find it within your community. I mean, not sorry, mm-hmm. within within your your uh, what do you call it? your safe haven? The the one mm-hmm. place, the one location where you're expected to 
be unconditionally supported and loved. And it turns mm-hmm. out that that exact same supposed safe space is is a bit of a cage in comparison mm-hmm. to what the rest of the world can offer. So like mm-hmm. I said, experience wise from from what I I have two gay uncles and ironically on either side, on both my mom's side and my dad's side. Oh. So it's how you explaining it and me me asking these questions is a lot of the things that I've I've asked them also being like I said, it's 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 difficult because one is accepted, one is known, the other one is accepted, but is barely forgotten that he mm-hmm. is, but it's it's kind of like swept under the rug. So it's it's always interesting to hear other stories of of how other cultures still to this day look at the and look at the sexuality aspect and it's 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 disheartening in reality it's really disheartening especially now that's 2024 you know times have changed this is a new norm now and they're still stuck in that old that the old ways Mm -hmm. but you can't change an old the older generation will it'll take a while for them to really accept it if they ever even accept it yeah this new generation like our age group we're embracing it because we we're so exposed to it. Like this is nothing. This is this is not new to us. Mm-hmm. And our generation after us will more than likely accept it. But it's the ones who grew up pre nineteen eighties. They're the ones that maybe the pre nineteen seventies even, but definitely before the eighties. If you grew up before the eighties, to to them majority of them. I don't want to say all of them, but majority of them will have a hard time to to accept that a guy likes another guy a girl likes another girl or a guy likes both guys and girls and girls like guys and girls yeah it's it's very true it's mm-hmm. really very true and and with that i do remember you telling me that you you've traveled the world you with besides being being a school teacher having all like i said all this interaction with with kids Kids from mm-hmm. all over, all over regions that have either been here, coming from other different countries, grew up in the states. But like I said, you've traveled the world. Where, where have you been? Focusing a little bit more on your experience as as an international traveler. Now, where have you been? What have been some of the places that that just you see a lot of differences that that could mm-hmm. probably be useful living in the states or or be good to like maybe start including him in the States. So besides America, I've been to Canada, but like Canada is like another mini America. I've been to Mexico. Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually went to Tijuana, so I wouldn't really say like deep into Mexico, Mm -hmm. but um, that was an interesting, that was an interesting uh, (laughs) trip. It was a good one though. I definitely would like to go back. Um, I've been to London, Paris, I've been to Ireland, which was very recent. I was planning to go to South Africa, but unfortunately there was a, a monkeypox breakout in Africa over the summertime. And I had like basically a week to make that decision whether I should go or not. And I figured, you know what, let me postpone the trip. I don't want to go and then feel very uneasy and uncomfortable during my trip, wondering if I got infected or not. So I postponed it to February. Um, I'm going to Chicago in November, uh, November with two friends. They have a competition there. I usually go to San Diego cause I'm a, I'm a nerd. I go to San Diego Comic-Con. Mm-hmm. Nice. Uh, uh, most of the countries on the East side, uh, I'm sorry, not countries on the, uh, on, uh, the States on the East side, you know, New York, Florida places like that but south africa is my is my next big trip gotcha and with with traveling to all of like those those major locations i guess Mm -hmm. uh you said ireland france uh the united kingdom what have you noticed Mm -hmm. from from being there and maybe if you have interacted with other other people with from other different cultures or just experiencing the the anglo-saxon or the european culture there what what differences have you seen there from the United States. The uh, Europe is much more lax, I've noticed. 
everything is so much easier over there. Everyone is friendlier. <laughs> no, no disrespect to the U.S., but I've noticed that they're just very kind. And the only thing is, I've noticed there's not in not in uh, excuse me, not in Ireland. Well, at least not in Dublin. But I've noticed in England and France, there's a big homeless population over there. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it's the same in New York, but. I was very surprised that in countries like that in Europe, that there's a big, uh, a big population of, of the homeless over there. Um, healthcare is, I think it's free or, or, or extremely cheap over there. Whereas here, I mean, if you don't have health insurance, forget it. You're paying an arm and a leg. Mm. Should you got to give them a liver, a liver of yours? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I feel like living in Europe, it's a much more easier a much a much more easier lifestyle there yeah it it is Compared a big difference mm -hmm. yeah there's definitely a big difference between the way that that does that people do interact and and the way that things are in in those mm -hmm. regions especially and then with with that it's it's really interesting because i've been to pretty much with the exception of the uk i've been to pretty much every single country you've mentioned so far so i've been to france been to oh, ireland wow. uh portugal scotland and nice. they're they're beautiful places they're really beautiful places and and mm -hmm. you're very right i mean it's it's been years i can honestly say it's been years since i actually went but i have been there and even even in my time in 2015 when i was there the the interaction was was very 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 quaint ireland surprised me a lot because mm -hmm. they're they're super friendly they're very, very friendly. They really are. Yeah, and then and in Scotland, and Scotland is a little bit more more neutral. It's it's definitely it it does give a little bit more kind of like a little bit of U.S. vibe. It's like all right, everybody's on their way. Everybody goes goes where they need to do. But if you stop and you ask a couple questions and and have difficulties finding your your way or or even just looking for recommendations like they're still very friendly and that that's one of the big mm -hmm. difference where where i've noticed as well with with the united states and being in europe is is that the the hospitality the way the yes. way the hospitality and and even being even even the fact that i'm mexican origin descent from mexican i'm still an american to them because i was there mm -hmm. as an american there's there's no mm -hmm. there's no um there's no separation. There's no major separation of between who really is American and who's from X location because mm -hmm. we give off a very specific, uh, I don't want to say bravado. We have a very specific way of, uh, we have a very specific presence. That's the biggest thing, even if we try to hide it. And, and I've had that same experience. So yeah. And, and I've had that same experience with, with even family members down in Mexico. They're like, no, you just give off that presence like you're you're yeah you're from here you speak spanish you you do what you do mm -hmm. but you're definitely an american and mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. it's really it's really weird to kind of separate that but like i said it's it's one of those things that that brings me back to to the to asking you about it it's like you're you're being perceived still as an american because you are an american Mm -hmm. No matter how you see it, no matter how people try to say it, it's like, yes, you you have your culture, you have your origins, you have your practices, but in in through and and true fashion, like you're still an American, no matter how, how they see it. With that, I wanted to ask you, have you in those trips, even mm -hmm. even though going to those countries as an American, did you ever experience anybody asking you or or trying to contradict you otherwise that just because you you were born there, but you weren't, you didn't look like the average American. Did that, there, was there any, was there ever, ever any, uh, I guess, contradiction or, or op opposition, I, I should say to, to you? Believe it or not, not, not at all, which is very strange. You would think that, but no, that's happened a lot here in America, obviously, but not, uh, not there. Which is good because it, it was like I, I felt safe then. I didn't have to worry about any of the racism there or any of that. Yeah, and and that's that's where I was going with that one. Is like you see those differences, you see those differences, mm -hmm. and and it brings a lot of into questions like what constitutes or what really is the the definition of what an American is, 
but mm-hmm. I guess I guess in both of our, of our experiences, it only applies. Being an American only applies being outside of the United States, being outside of America. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah I agree. Now, let me see. Um, there was another question I was going to ask, and I totally forgot about. Go ahead. Um, Uh, actually, yeah. Speaking back to your your experience as a teacher, how okay. how long have you been a teacher? So many years that I've lost count. <laughs> and you said you specialized yes. in uh, special needs classes, correct? In special needs classes, mm-hmm. yes. Uh, it's been years. God, I was an assistant for a while, and I've been teaching for God. 12, 13 years, something like that. It's been a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So from your from your experience with both the educational system, uh, from how you grew up to how now you're a teacher, what what differences mm-hmm. do you see now that like I said, in 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 respect to, to culture and the way that you interact with, with your students and other students? Like what other differences or or even strides have you seen with with the way that we're trying to be well, I guess the United States or the, the educational system is trying to be a lot more inclusive both to to cultures and and opinions, but also specifically towards the, the what do you call it, the special needs community in that sense. Well, the special needs back in the 90s, it was pretty, un- I don't want to say unknown, but it wasn't as high as it is now. So you would always... You, if when we grew up, we would always have like, oh, that one weird kid. That's what we would say. Oh, like that one, that one kid, like everyone would know who it is. But now it's just a norm. Now everyone has a special needs. Um, they're definitely much more inclusive now. Mm-hmm. I personally also make sure that they're included in everything, whether it be including them in the, uh, uh, yearbook photos, including them into what we have is like spirit week every day of the week for certain times certain times of the year we'll have things like uh let's say for example the middle of october we have spirit week monday wear a sports jersey someone will go around taking pictures and uploading it in their um on the school the school instagram page i'll make sure that my students are also included in that because why not they're they're no different than that average fourth grader that's that's doing well in in math um cultural wise they're definitely recognizing a lot more cultures now um recently chinese new year and eid has been included as days off for public schools back then it wasn't Mm -hmm. so it's good to know that let's not just focus on christmas and thanksgiving as holidays and having days off or now we've got well we've had like rosh hashanah yom kippur which is great but it's good to see that the Chinese are also getting recognized with their culture and they, they deserve their day off because of how many Chinese live in, in New York, especially. Same thing with the Muslims now with, uh, with, uh, with Eid. Both days we have off because of how high the population is. So it's just good to see that other cultures are now finally being embraced and recognized. Uh, my school especially, we have things like Greek Independence Day where we'll have a parade in our school and we'll learn about the culture, we'll color the flags. Uh, we had um, something recently, uh, was it last year? I believe it was last year. Yes, it was last year. It was like a farmer's market for the Italians. And we had things like tomatoes and, and other vegetables. It was cute. And we had, oh God, I forgot what else it was, but it was it was cute. It was nice. We have that. Every year we, uh, we have uh, a Chinese New Year, uh, like a whole week dedicated to the Chinese Lunar New Year. And we would have an assembly where we, we would have performances and learn about the history and the culture. So I like the fact that back then it wasn't as recognized as it is now. I think it's important that we start learning about more cultures. We start learning about, hey, America is not just eating a hamburger and hot dog, going to a baseball game and, you know, yeah, I'm American, things like that. Now you know that it's a melting pot. There's gonna your neighbor could be from another country. Let's get to know where they're from. I love things like that. So growing up, 
I was a Muslim from Afghanistan. No one knew where Afghanistan was. Now, everyone knows where Afghanistan is, not just from 9-11, but also just the fact that everyone is being included now. And it's important. I like that. No, that's true. And then those are a lot of great changes that have happened, that have been happening. And, and I like the fact that it's actually, it's not just specific or just overly generalized, you know, how mm-hmm. it's all just mm-hmm. kind of being put out there. It's like, oh, we're going to start including this in an X calendar, federal calendar, because it's, it's a part of it. It's like how you're mentioning it's, it's very central. It's not centralized. It's, it's regional wise because in, in the, uh, what do you call it? In the West coast, California, San Diego, like I said, you've been out there. A lot of the Hispanic community, ours is mm-hmm. uh, May 5th. And, and for us, we still don't celebrate Independence Day, but Chicago does a huge Independence Day because that's the largest Mexican community in, in the States outside of California mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, outside of California and like New Mexico and Texas. And then, and in certain regions and, and other places like down South in, in Miami and uh, Florida, Orlando, how they do the, the Cuban day. Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah uh Puerto Rican parades, Cuban parades, stuff like that. So yeah. like that's that is that's that's a, that's a really good point that you bring up with with how there's there's a lot more inclusion to the cultures and and to to different ethnic backgrounds being available for for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So with that, I think we've covered a pretty good portion of of the story of your story and and a lot of the questions that I actually wanted to ask and and anything else that that just kind of came to mind at the moment, but is there anything else you want to say? Any other specific questions you might have or, or if you would like to come back for a different episode, maybe you should think of a different topic. No, we should, I definitely want to come back as a guest again for another topic, anything that you want to talk about. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So we will definitely do that. I mean, right now, actually thinking back, you said San Diego comic-con. I've always wanted to go San Diego mm-hmm. to San Diego comic-con. Um, I'm a big I don't say I'm a big nerd. I'm definitely a geek. I definitely delve into a lot of that stuff. So uh-huh. to I would actually like to get your perspective on on a couple other things so we can definitely set up a, a future episode for that, and especially since you've been to Comic Con and mm-hmm. I'm guessing you've been there for for a couple a couple seasons. So I definitely oh, yeah. have a couple of questions for that. <laughs> Ask away anytime. Gotcha. Well, Haj, thank you. Thank you very much for for accepting this this interview to the ESL the ESL sessions in this in enigma the enigma episodes and i hope this story really helps out and and gives a little bit more perspective to to your side of the culture to to your experience and and especially to our listeners well thank you for having me i appreciate it and giving me the uh the opportunity to tell my story not a problem well i will definitely have you back for another episode so we'll go ahead we'll close it off right here thank you and have a have a good rest of your day likewise have a good day